A report from The Intercept links fare collection from public transit systems with a military contractor that's keen on collecting data. Your data. I'm Yasmin Khan with Rebel HQ, and Cubic Transportation Systems is at the forefront of the smart city, the city of the future where technology seamlessly integrates into our lives and vice versa. It's a future where minor inconveniences like fumbling for metro cards and cash are no longer parts of our lives, and it's a future where technology adoption is no longer optional despite any financial setbacks you'll have to personally endure as a result of said adoption. Now, Cubic isn't selling us anything we aren't already intimately familiar with. It boasts convenience and ease, offering us ticketless travel options via the smartphone that you've already got in your pocket, and real-time traffic updates based on aggregated data from millions of other smartphones in millions of other pockets, all for the seemingly low cost of nothing you're not already paying. You already pay for your phone, so this technology is just a matter of downloading another app. You're already used to buying train tickets, but now you're just doing it in a different place. And of course, you're already used to surrendering your data to corporations because you're given little choice but to do so these days. So whatever, what's a little bit more personal data to another corporation? But according to reporting from The Intercept, this is darker than what the de facto forced adoption of technology would imply on its own. Cubic isn't just a private corporation capitalizing on more efficient public transit systems. It's a defense contractor that's been awarded billions of dollars from the United States government over the past several decades for various intelligence and surveillance-related initiatives. Cubic has been acquiring contracts to overhaul the public transit systems in major cities across the United States, meaning that they're gaining access to millions of people's travel data and more. With this type of technology, there's always a paper trail, and moving around freely with anonymity becomes more and more difficult, if not impossible. Albert Fox Kahn, the founder and executive director of the Surveillance Technology and Oversight Project, said, quote, I'm deeply concerned about how the development of smart cities creates growing incentives for companies like Cubic to aggregate our data and then sell it to the police, ICE, and other agencies. Right now, our data is a huge part of the product with almost no safeguards against these sorts of abuse. The Intercept breaks down the company's financial and military ties to the United States government, stating, quote, Since 1992, U.S. government agencies have awarded Cubic's defense wing and its subsidiaries billions of dollars in contracts, including more than $42.1 million from the Department of Defense this year alone. One of Cubic's largest contracts came in 2020, when the Pentagon awarded the company $193.3 million to work on training systems, with over half of the money allocated to foreign military sales in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Morocco, Oman, Poland, Qatar, Singapore, Australia, and the UK. Cubic has also provided key support for U.S. drone operations. The company received $1.4 million from the U.S. Air Force in 2018 for Predator slash Reaper training software. And in 2020, it signed a cooperative agreement with U.S. Special Operations for the research and development of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance technologies related to drones. Cubic also sells surveillance technologies. A subsidiary that sells video enhancement software has clients including the New York Police Department, U.S. Secret Service, and military criminal investigators, end quote. Now, for the record, Cubic maintains that its work in the public transit sector is separate from its military operations, but tracking is already a concern for many Americans. To give one very large example, there's concern that women's movements will be tracked in an effort to convict them of crimes related to women's health care and abortions. There have already been social media campaigns alerting women to stop using apps to track their menstrual cycles on their phones in case that data is sold to government agencies. Now, while many of us are just now getting used to the fact that we live in a surveillance state, most of us have already accepted or at least acknowledged that we're living in an adopt-or-die reality. And while an argument could be made that that's the way the world 
has always functioned to some extent. We've never been forced to adapt or adopt so rapidly and so frequently as we've been expected to in the past couple of decades. The speed with which technology changes these days is a chore for most individuals to keep up with, though it's practically required that we do so lest we be left behind by our jobs, our friends and families, and society. These days, a smartphone is no longer a perk as it was when the iPhone was first announced. We're expected to have one. Of course, you can still find ways around these things, but it's very difficult. It requires that you live your life in a way that's now counter to the prevailing culture, in a way that you'd have to explain yourself to others, maybe including your boss, and you'd have to take additional steps in your life to accommodate your choices. Ultimately, you can refuse to adopt for any number of good reasons, but as society molds itself around certain technologies, your refusal has the potential to make your life very, very inconvenient. Now, apart from that, there's the inherent classism associated with the societal pressure to spend thousands of dollars on technology that you may or may not even want to participate in. If you look back at the advent of the motor car, it started off as a way to get from point A to point B faster than we were able to before. Fast forward 100 years and our entire country has literally been built around cars. We have noisy, polluted cities. We've paved over green spaces so that our cars have somewhere to sit. We waste years of our lives sitting in traffic. We've designed the modern workplace around commutes. Residential zoning areas in suburbs require that we need to get into a car just to go pick up some bread. And our entire planet is overheating to the point that it's threatening the very existence of humanity because these things run on fossil fuels. Still, despite how horrible cars are for the environment, society, and urban development, most of us can't live in this country without one because our neighborhoods and cities are designed to be car-centric. I live in the suburbs of Houston, Texas. If I wanted to walk to my nearest grocery store, it would take me at least 45 minutes. And in Houston heat, that can actually be dangerous. And same with my phone. I don't even like being on my phone if I can avoid it, but if it dies when I'm out and about, it's kind of a problem. We've created a world where the simplicity of living a simple life is made all the more complicated by our own surroundings. We can't avoid plastic despite how much we would like to. We can't function without microchips despite how much we would like to. We can't not consume ads despite how much we would really not like to. Capitalism promises choice and freedom to the individual. You have the choice to partake in a system. You have the choice of where you spend your money. You have the choice in how you earn your money. However, the reality that we all know today is that we are tethered to systems that we can't reasonably break free from without being significantly left behind in some way, shape, or form. We're given the illusion of choice, of competition, of adopting or opting out, but in cases related to things like public transit, the choice between getting to work or not getting to work isn't much of a choice, is it? All right, that's it for me. If you got something out of this content, please like and subscribe and be sure to follow me over on Instagram and TikTok.